Last week, I told you about how the case of Dr. Sam Shepard eerily mirrored that of Scott Peterson. Today, let's return to Cleveland to uncover the case that inspired the fugitive and try to figure out what really happened. Hey everyone, welcome back to Popular Crime. I'm Joe, and let's get started with today's case. In researching that previous video on Sam Shepard, I found a tremendous resource for the case, and I included it as a link in the description. But that quick overview really piqued my curiosity. This was a huge case, so naturally I started to look into it more. And for those of you who missed the first video, I'll link it below, but let me quickly recap. On July 4, 1954, the small town of Bay Village awoke to reports of the murder of Marilyn Shepard. Bay Village is a suburb of Cleveland located on Lake Erie. Marilyn's husband, Sam, reported her death to his friend, Spencer Houck, who was the mayor of Bay Village at the time. Police arrived moments after Houck did, along with his wife, Esther, and that began the investigation. Due to the media scrutiny, the case grew too large for the police in Bay Village, and Cleveland police as well as Cuyahoga County officials took over. But what made the case grow and grow the most was the intense media scrutiny. Headlines in the major daily papers created an air of inevitability around the guilt of Dr. Shepard. And eventually, when the district attorney took too long to file charges, they began to call for Shepard's arrest explicitly. This was, without a doubt, one of the most shameful displays of media manipulation I have ever heard about. Speculation was reported as fact without corroboration at all. The leaks reporters got from police went straight to press. Through those leaks and all the speculation, Sam Shepard was convicted in the public eye long before he had his day in court. In part, this is why public sentiment eroded so quickly after Shepard's conviction. There was no clear evidence. After the media scrutiny moved on to a new outrage, people who were interested in the case began to take a more measured look into what happened. Sadly, this did not happen before several of Shepard's family and other individuals associated with the Shepard family lost their lives, some of them by their own hand. That's just odd about any type of case, but the numbers, and you'll, we'll talk about this just now, it's mind-boggling. Among those who died were Sam's mother, Ethel. She took her own life. Sam's father, Richard, died due to complications from stomach cancer. Ethel and Richard died less than two weeks apart. Additionally, Marilyn's father, Thomas Reese, he also took his own life. And finally, William Corrigan, Sam's friend and attorney, he suffered a stroke that ended his life. The death of Corrigan left Sam with a void. He needed to find a new lawyer. And he and his family turned to the legendary F. Lee Bailey, who we talked about in June after his death. Bailey injected new life into the appeal and finally Shepard was freed after a second trial was ordered by the Supreme Court. That was 1966, a dozen years after he was convicted. At the second Shepard trial, he was found not guilty. The jury deliberated for less than a day. There were three factors that enabled such a dramatic change in sentiment. The first was the work of Dr. Paul Leland Kirk. He was a brilliant criminalist who looked at the evidence and refuted much of what was presented against Shepard. Kirk's affidavit pointed to six points that he documented with photographs illustrating his claims. Those points are as follows. First, the perpetrator was left-handed. Second, Marilyn had bitten her attacker and drawn blood. Third, the perpetrator left a large blood stain on the closet door, likely from his injured hand. Fourth, tests of the blood stain did not match either Marilyn or Sam Shepard, thus showing at a minimum a third person was present. Fifth, the weapon used was a blunt cylinder rather than an edged weapon like the surgical tools the Cuyahoga County coroner asserted. Finally, the evidence that Dr. Kirk presented showed that this was not merely a violent attack, but was a sexual one as well. The evidence Dr. Kirk cited was from the way Marilyn's clothing was partially removed by her assailant. While this point was not directly exculpatory, it did indicate the failure of investigators to understand the crime scene. One other thing to note, 
Reading Dr. Kirk's affidavit reminds me of the work that Dr. Henry Lee has done in reading blood spatter and analyzing a crime scene. Kirk's experiments and the conclusion he draws highlight how important this aspect of crime scene investigation is to understanding what happened. The second factor that changed public opinion was the power of positive media. When The Fugitive debuted on television, the parallels to the Sam Shepard case were blatantly obvious. And in time, the public saw Dr. Richard Kimball as Dr. Sam Shepard, and the heroic acts of the fictional Dr. Kimball rehabilitated the imprisoned Dr. Shepard. This is a powerful technique of framing used by many persuaders to lead people to their way of thinking. By presenting a heroic figure who is closely aligned with a real person, the public sees the real person in a new light. This is one of the reasons that defendants who are media savvy, or lawyers who know how to position stories in the media to drive a certain narrative, tend to have more success in court. They can alter public perception, which no doubt impacts a jury pool. It's also why investigators leak damning details about a suspect to the press. An obvious and egregious example of this is the case of the late Richard Jewell, who was believed to be the Atlanta Olympic bomber and whose reputation was destroyed by the media repeating false allegations made by FBI and local police. This is a fascinating case that was documented in a great Clint Eastwood picture from a few years ago, and one we'll cover in a separate video. Finally, the progress of time helped reshape public sentiment about the case. In 1954, emotions ran hot that Dr. Shepard had killed his wife, but 12 years later, people did not feel the same emotional highs they did earlier. Likewise, the community in and around Cleveland had changed quite a bit. A similar phenomena occurred in New York in the 80s and 90s in the Bernie Getz case. This is a fascinating story. In the 1980s, when Getz shot four young men in a subway car, many New Yorkers felt he was acting in self-defense due to how dangerous the subway system was at the time. He was acquitted of all charges, but in the civil trial, which occurred 11 years later, many New Yorkers felt safer and therefore Getz's behaviors were not seen as reasonable. He lost the civil judgment and is on the hook for $43 million in damages. Just like Richard Jewell, we'll talk about this case in a future video as well. Anyway, getting back to Dr. Shepard. If he was not guilty, who was? Sadly, we'll never know. But several suspects have emerged in the years since this crime took place. Let's start with the obvious one. I alluded to Richard Eberling in the previous video. Eberling turned his work that he was doing for the Shepherds and others, specifically for the Shepherds, he was washing their windows. He turned that into a more lucrative gig by casing some of the houses that he worked at and lifting cash and jewelry. One of his clients accused him of theft and police found evidence of his thievery. And among the items they recovered, were some of Marilyn Shepard's missing jewelry. So they questioned him about Marilyn Shepard and his answers raised their suspicions. In the late 1990s, Eberling had been cast as the prime suspect as the lawyer for the Shepard family announced DNA testing done on the blood at the crime scene was conclusively not Sam Shepard's blood. And according to the doctor who performed the tests, the blood was Eberling's. Maybe he was good for it, but Eberling was right-handed so there is some doubt. Likewise, at the retrial, F. Lee Bailey didn't go all in on Eberling. He believed that the polygraph Eberling took exonerated him. Instead, Bailey hammered on Mayor Spencer Houck and his wife Esther. The motive, according to Bailey, Spencer and Marilyn were having an affair. Bailey had sent a letter to the Bay Village police chief making this claim, and it fits somewhat but this theory leaves as many questions as it answers. Several other suspects were looked at by police and Shepard's defense teams through the years, but many of them were the kinds of tips you might see called in to America's most wanted or unsolved mysteries. You know, wild theories about a resemblance of a suspect in a case in Reno or tree trimmers who worked for the Shepherds or others who the tipster is convinced must have committed the crime. And as with many other prominent cases, there is of course a confession from someone who in all likelihood never committed the crime and probably wasn't even in Cleveland on the night that it was committed. He later recanted and was released, of course. When you look at it, despite the lack of hard evidence and the damage the media did in prejudicing a jury, the most obvious suspect remains Sam Shepard. 
And that brings us to the wildest theory. This is speculation, and not exactly my own. A fellow inmate of Richard Eberling claimed, in reports made both in the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times, that Eberling alleged Shepard had hired him to commit the crime. It does fit a few of the details that we know, but I'm not sure about it. Likewise, we know from the investigation that Shepard and Everling barely knew each other. But the truth is, his initial statements were very confused and disjointed. Some of that can be explained by the blow to the head that he claimed he had received. But some of it was just that this statement, and all of his subsequent statements, didn't make a ton of sense. Not to the police, not to the coroner, not to the grand juries, not to the judges trying the case. It almost seemed that he was just kind of hoping that there'd be enough reasonable doubt to get away. And ultimately, that's what happened. This case remains unsolved. No one has been arrested. No one has been tried since Sam Shepard was freed. Shepard himself died due to liver failure in 1970. He was 46 years old at the time. Since his passing, his son, Chip, has worked tirelessly to prove his father's innocence. And that's all I have on this landmark, fascinating, and sadly, unsolved case. It remains a modern mystery of popular crime. Thanks so much for watching. If you are new to our channel, we appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us. And if you've made it this far, you probably have figured out this is a good channel for you to tune into. We post videos on missing persons cases, mysteries, true crime, and unusual stories, and we do so a couple times a week. So, if you like what you've seen, please consider subscribing, liking the video, sharing it with someone who you think would appreciate it, as well as signing up for notifications. Look forward to sharing a new case with you next week, and until then, stay safe, keep investigating, and we'll see you soon.